afternoon, everyone. We're going to continue uh, with the uh, meeting today. And our second hour, uh, we're uh, very pleased to have uh, Madame Nancy Belanger here from the uh, commissioner. She's the commissioner of lobbying. Uh, Ms. Belanger, welcome to committee. You have up to uh, five minutes to address the committee. Please start. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président et membres du... Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today on the main estimates. I am very pleased to meet a number of you for the first time and to speak to you about the work carried out by my office. The Lobbying Act requires that I maintain the registry of lobbyists, that I expand awareness and understanding of the lobbying regimes through education, and that I conduct compliance work that supports respect of the Act and the Lobbyist Code of Conduct. Let, re let me report on some of the highlights from the 2023-2024 fiscal year. Over 7,000 lobbyists were registered with over 5,700 active registrations at any given time. Monthly reports of oral and arranged communications with designated public office holders attained a record high with over 32,000 communications reported. That's with this morning's statistics. We reached about 4,800 stakeholders through approximately 123 outreach presentations. In carrying out our advisory role, we respond to over, responded to over 400 requests to ensure compliance with the new lobbyist <coughs> code of conduct. In addition to 37 compliance files carried out over at the end of the fiscal year 2022-23, we initiated 16 preliminary assessments and determined that no further action was required in 14 cases. I opened two investigations, made two referrals to the RCMP, and tabled one investigation report to Parliament. Priorities for the current fiscal year include the continuous improvement of the Registry of Lobbyists. Recently, we updated the registry so that subject matters and their corresponding details are linked to each other in registrations, thereby improving transparency. This fall, another update will require lobbyists to identify the details associated with the subject matter that was discussed when submitting monthly communication reports. <coughs> we are continuing to develop ways to expand awareness and understanding of the Lobbying Act and the Lobbyist Code of Conduct. We are updating our interpretation materials with respect to the application and enforcement of the Act and will issue advisory notes in respect to the Code. Advancing on 34 ongoing compliance files. The Lobbying Act requires that investigation be conducted when I have reason to believe that one is necessary to ensure compliance. When I have reasonable grounds to believe an offense under the Act has occurred, I am required to suspend my investigation and refer the matter to the appropriate police authority, in most cases the RCMP. There are currently four files suspended and with the RCMP. With respect to investigations conducted under the code, I am required, once I conclude an investigation, to report to Parliament on my findings. As you are aware, the Act imposes strict confidentiality requirements and I cannot, therefore, discuss the specifics of any compliance files. The Office delivers on its mandate and fulfills its corporate functions, including by meeting extensive government-wide reporting requirements through the invaluable work of a small number of employees, which now averages 31 staff positions. We are continuing our staffing actions to ensure a full complement of 37 FTEs by the end of the year. The total annual budget for this current fiscal year is approximately 5.9 million. Roughly 4.6 goes to salaries and benefits, leaving an operating budget of 1.3 million. About 700,000 of that operating budget is spent on obtaining services from other government institutions, including services related to HR, finance, procurement, and information technology. Before I conclude, I must reiterate that the Lobbying Act requires this committee to undertake a review of the Act every five years. The last review occurred in 2012. Two opportunities to improve the lobbying regime have been missed in both 2017 and 2022. I will continue to identify and pursue improvements that could enhance the transparency, fairness, clarity, and efficiency of the federal lobbying regime. 
but most of the regime's identified deficiencies can only be addressed through legislative <laughs> amendments. I would urge this committee to avoid any further delays, prioritize initiating a review of the Act, and put forward legislative amendments. Of course, I'd like to conclude by thanking each and every employee of the office. They are actively engaged and contribute to an exceptional work environment. I'm extremely grateful for their dedication, professionalism, and excellence in delivering on our mandate. Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you, and I welcome your questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Belanger. <clears throat> uh, we are going to start with our first six-minute round. Uh, Mr. Barrett, you have six minutes. Go ahead, please. Commissioner, if a company says a significant part of what it does is contacting and communicating with government, should they be registered to lobby? If they meet the threshold of significant part of duties, absolutely. Okay, I'll circle back to that. If the contact and communication includes pitching products and services and providing hospitality to government officials, should they be required to lobby, to uh, register to lobby? Well, procurement is only a requirement if it's a consultant lobbying, not if it's an organization or corporation. So it will depend. So with respect to the amount of time that is required for, uh, of time lobbying required for, uh, that, that, that necessitates the requirement for registration, how many hours a week in contact and communication with government uh, does a company need to undertake to be, uh, to be required to register? It's approximately eight hours a week. It's calculated 20% of your time, and we look at it in a month at a time, so about 30 hours a month. And is that the written, or is that just the the standard development developed through uh, That is the through standard precedence? that's been developed by the office going back to when the office was first created, practically, because those words are used in the Act. Okay, so um, eight hours a week, um, 32 hours a month, that's about it? <laughs> that's too much lobbying that, that does not require um, registration, so another pitch to amend the Lobbying Act. Uh, but everybody should know that I am looking at the interpretation bulletin around the word significant part of duties, and I am considering um, amending that threshold. I wrote to you about a month ago regarding GC strategies. Um, this is the Liberal government's hand-picked favorite IT firm. They don't do work um, on the applications, uh, but uh, collect a commission for connecting the government with unknown firms like uh, the giant KPMG with 10,000 employees and 40 corporate offices across Canada. Can you tell us today if you're investigating GC strategies or its principles for contravening the Lobbying Act? I, as I told you in the letter, I'm very much aware of the facts of that case, and I cannot confirm whether I'm investigating. And you know that I do that because I do not want to jeopardize a possible RSCMP investigation. Okay. Um, so this uh, two-man operation has said that they have devoted a significant part of what they do um, to contact and communication with the government, more than 80 hours per month. Um, were you aware of that previously, or like Canadians, did you learn that during the testimony of, um, of these individuals at committee? Well, GC Strategies was never registered, so I learned of all the activities like all other Canadians. So just for, just for clarity, um, are you able to confirm if Mr. Christian Firth is being investigated by your office? I cannot confirm that. Thank you. Um, Christian Firth admitted to meeting a host of government officials outside of offices. Paul Girard, who's the former chief uh, uh, information officer, Dan Godro, a DG at Heritage, um, Jeff Lemerand, a program manager, Philip Johnson, a former CIO, Mark Briard, Cameron McDonald, Antonio Utano, Savak Askabashian, uh, Ross Gordon, Gary Hoban, Chaluka Alaparuma, Gary Davis, um, should Christian Firth of GC Strategies be investigated hearing that, that big list of names and uh, that 
the, the amount of lobbying that he says he's undertaken? As, I, as I've said before, I'm aware of the facts. I know exactly that list you're talking about, but I can't confirm at what stage this file is at. How many investigations are currently ongoing with your office? Right now, we have one active investigation. Um, how many um, investigations have you paused, having referred them to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police? Right now, there are four suspended. There are actually six suspended, but they've just returned two. So with the RCMP, there are four investigations. And um, how many have been returned by the RCMP to your office that you referred to them? Well, if, if I um, go back to my... I've been in office for six and a half years, and I referred approximately 15. Okay. There's been two charges. They still have four. So the math is that they've returned the rest of them. Right. And, and just while we're here, I, I've, I've got less than a minute left. I appreciate your responses. I, I did just want to mention, of course, that while we're talking about lobbying and in the context of the cost of living crisis that we have, you know, Don Guy, who's a senior liberal, he collects checks from law laws. And last year, his firm, GT and Company, met twice with the Prime Minister's Director of Policy, John Broadhead. Wow. Don Guy's daughter uh, used to work in the Prime Minister's office for uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Uh, their chief pollster, Dan Arnold, is paid by a law loss lobbyist. Um, Taika Bakht in, is an in-house lobbyist for Loblaws, used to be the PM's regional advisor. Last year, she was able to get a meeting with um, Mr. Broadhead, her former colleague and the PM's director of policy. The PM's new marketing wizard, Max Valiquet, did marketing for Loblaws for four years. So when we wonder um, about the cost of living crisis we have and why the Liberals you know, haven't, uh, haven't grabbed that tiger by the tail, um, we just need to look no further than uh, many of these people like Kevin Bosch or Julie DeWolf, the list goes on. Thank you, Mr. Wow. Barrett. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Baines, for six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, for joining us today. Um, uh, the federal lobbying regime sets requirements and standards for the transparent and ethical lobbying of federal officials. Do you believe that these standards are known and respected? I believe that they're known. I believe when I look at statistics that for the most part that they are being uh, respected, yes. And, and I know um, uh, a colleague from across the way was talking about uh, specifically about GC strategies and, and we know that they've been uh, around Mr. Firth and his partner um, for over 20 years working alongside uh, various government officials. Um, and I'm curious about the name cha changing a name from what they maybe have been operating from before to changing it to something else. Is that so a way of circumventing rules in any way, lobbying? Well, I certainly wouldn't accept that as an excuse for circum circumventing the rules. But is that something that should be looked at as um, a problem? If, if you're um, operating for years and all of a sudden say a government changes and all of a sudden you change your name, is that, a, is that something that it, should be looked at? Well, I certainly, if, if I have allegations of an organization or a corporation or a firm that has been lobbying while not registered, the change of name doesn't affect the way I will look at the, at the file of whether or not they met the threshold and they sh if they should have been registered. So what challenges is your office facing when it comes to ensuring that rules outlined in the Act and the Code are not circumvented? What are some other challenges? Well, the, the, the biggest challenge is the significant part of duty threshold. There is a lot of lobbying that is occurring that doesn't require to be registered. And I receive some allegations. I actually see things in the news and I look into it to see if they meet the threshold, but very often, um, organizations or corporations will stay under the threshold so that they don't need to register, and that needs to be fixed. So um, if I was to go further on that, just exactly yes. what you said, you, you, you look at news reports, and we've seen <clears throat> media reporting and letters received by your office that you're well aware of the circumstances around Ms. Jenny Byrne, for example, and four-check strategies. Of particular concern is that staff of Ms. Byrne and associates use the name of four-check strategies to lobby federally, including to lobby members of the Conservative Party, um, the leader of the opposition, and uh, some 
obvious contraventions may be happening there to the 2023 code outlined in the reporting on this issue, specifically section 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3. So is there an ongoing investigation into this matter? I can confirm that I have, I am looking into that matter as every single thing that you send me, I look into the matter unless, of course, I've already started it, which often that happens as well. Okay, and what, what's the process in your office when you become aware of something like that? Mm -hmm. What's the process? So the process is we open a preliminary assessment and we have a matrix to, to determine the, uh, the level. You know, one of my biggest uh, challenges is to stay relevant and make sure that we are quick in our files, that if we need to send something to the RCMP, we do it quickly. If we need to report to Parliament on a code issue, I, so I evaluate the importance or the relevance, the public interest in a file. We open a preliminary assessment and we do our preliminary work. Is, is there even closely, remotely significant part of duty threshold met? We seek a lot of information from public office holders, public servants, which they send us the information. We evaluate and if I have reason to believe that investigation is necessary to ensure compliance, I open an investigation. And, and then it, from there, it's either a report to Parliament if it's a code issue or I refer to the RCMP if it's an act issue. So this is ongoing? Have you completed your initial review? No, it's ongoing. It's ongoing. And, and you haven't had to suspend the investigation for any reason? It's continuing right now? I would, I would not confirm that in any event. Okay. How much time? <clears throat> Um, I'm going to go into, so just specifically on section 4.1, it states that you should never lobby an individual who may have a sense of obligation due to a close personal relationship. So it's, I know it's sort of, I mentioned somewhat in the first, the previous question, but specifically with Ms. Byrne, there's also been reports that Mr. Polyev and Ms. Byrne share a well-documented long-standing personal and professional relationship and recent media coverage has shed light on Ms. Byrne's close ties to the office of the Leader of the Opposition. So based on a review of publicly available information, do you believe that Ms. Byrne and Ms. Polyev share a quote-unquote close personal relationship consistent with 4.1? Well, you're going to have to let me do my work because the code only applies to lobbyists that are registered to lobby the federal government. The code does not apply to someone who's not registered to lobby any one of you. So, so that's the first step. Yeah, okay. So, so if someone's lobbying and they're not registered, then... That's problem. Then that's an act issue. So there's, there, if there's unregistered lobbying happening, it's under the act and it's an offense and that would have to be referred to the RCMP. If they're registered to lobby and they breach the code of conduct, then I can complete that investigation and report to Parliament. So... I know you said, let me do my job. So, we'll let you do your job there, but, yes. and, and, but okay, I'm we're, looking, uh, forward we're to, time. looking forward to the yes. outcome of that. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Monsieur Vermeer for uh, six minutes. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. You have six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being with us yet again, Ms. Bélanger. You are one of the commissioners that we know will always launch an investigation when necessary, and we appreciate it. I want to know, how is it in lobbying right now? You have a new code. Well, it's very active. Our team is working very hard. All of these stats are increasing, and so lobbying activities are quite high. We've had a lot of requests to interpret the new code, especially for exemptions for gifts and hospitality. So that's kept us quite busy. Things are going well. So the code was well received. Yes, I think so. It's been about a year or will be in July, and I haven't received any complaints. Perhaps you've heard some complaints, but I haven't received any. No complaints. No. Complaints regarding compliance? Well, yes, I am currently examining some. Inaudible. For the code, I've got perhaps fewer than five. It's mostly allegations of unregistered lobbying that we receive or that I have to examine. Do you refer many during the year? Last year I referred two of them. 
I've referred 15 cases since I became commissioner, so it depends on the file. I don't make them up, of course, so... If the threshold is met, and the threshold is low, if I have reasonable grounds to suspect, then I refer it. That's how many cases per year. We have about 30 files on average ongoing. We're looking at the budget for the office. Do you have sufficient resources to do your work? To my satisfaction, probably not, because I would like to do a lot more, but I only have 30 employees. And I have the funding for 37, so we are trying to recruit, but it's difficult to find people who have the necessary competencies. For the budget, I had asked for a lot more than what I received for the 2023 budget. I received half, in fact, of what I had asked for. We do a lot with the limited number of employees. I believe that your budget is decided by Parliament and not a recurring budget. It's different from the Ethics Commissioner, for example. Yes, it's decided as for any other department. It has an impact on independence. I don't legislate, f regulate departments. I work with lobbyists, but for those who have to deal with departments that are being investigated and, and then they have to make the request for additional funding, it, there might seem to be a conflict of interest for independence. Perceived conflict, yes. You have fewer resources than you would have wanted. Does that have an impact on the number of investigations? Answer, no. My issue this year is that I have three people in the investigations team that have gone on parental leave, so three out of six, and this has had an impact on my compliance <laughs> numbers. You mentioned earlier that you require a special type of person. Well, it depends on the, on the different field. For investigations, we like to have someone that has experience with investigations, of course, but also for analysis. We need analysis schools, skills, rather. And if we're looking for somebody in communication, we only have one person. Well, we want somebody with experience in communication. It really depends on the field. Information management, we're looking for someone in IT. You know, we need somebody who has an expertise in the language that we use, and we re require specific experience. When we think about the lobbying commissioner, we think about investigations, but what does the rest of your week look like? As I mentioned, we carried a, or we offered 123 presentations. We are a very small team. We offer a lot of advice. We have customer a customer service team that works with lobbyists to ensure that they understand mm -hmm. legislation. We have over 7,000 lobbyists who are registered and so we do a lot of awareness raising. I think that that's a big part of my job as well. Do you believe that the lobbying commissioner could have a registry of foreign agents with additional funding, of course? Well, we would need the additional funding, and we would need the expertise as well in national security, which we don't have. Is that something that you could do? I'm a little skeptical. It's something that's been done elsewhere. I personally would not want to have that mandate, because the goal is different. Lobbying, according to the Registry and the Act, is something that needs to be transparent, whereas a foreign registry is different, and I think that the goals would be different. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you, Monsieur Villemur and Ms. Bélanger. We're going to start with six minutes for Mr. Green. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Ms. Belanger, I'm going to put to you a series of questions in a rather rapid way. Um, I'm going to try to get as most out of this round as I possibly can. So if you could be as succinct as you can, that would be super helpful. And if I intervene, it's not out of disrespect. It's just to get on to the next question. What is the purpose of not allowing registered lobbyists to provide sponsored travel? 
to ensure that um, there is no perception of conflict of interest and a sense of obligation from the public office holder to the lobbyist. Would it be safe to say that those that offered sponsored travel uh, paying for trips and paying for lavish accommodations and food and all of these things would have a, a motive? Would that be safe to say? Well, I don't know if they have a motive, but certainly if sponsored travel is offered, there's a reason for it. And if they plan on lobbying afterwards, there would be a cooling off period. And you had mentioned a perception of interest. I think that's important, having the perception of the conflict of interest, because there would be, I think, a, a, a rational perception by the public that MPs could be influenced on an issue pertaining to that country or that organization. Is that correct? That's correct. And, you know, there's almost a limitless amount that could be spent in this regard. Can members of the public make complaints to your office about suspected breaches of the code? Absolutely. And I do receive some. And are they informed of when you are undertaking an investigation? Uh, an investigation, no. They are all informed that I will review the matter, and if it concludes into a report to Parliament, they'll be made aware at that time. Are you aware of any registered lobbyists who have sponsored MP travel since the new rules came into effect last year? Yes, and I know what you're referring to, and it's that, that trip in, in July of, of last year. Um, if you want, do I have time to speak to that matter? Would you like me yes, to speak to that do. matter? Yes. Um, yes. I, I did, um, as you all know, the, the new code came into force on July 1st, and uh, in May, I had received, and I did receive consent from CJA to speak to this issue. Um, they did ask me if I could suspend the application of the code for the month of July in light of the fact that they had two trips already organized. And I did not think it was fair to tell them not to pursue that trip since it had been organized for more than six months, I think. Um, and, but I did tell them that if they were going to pursue the trip, there would be a cooling off period with respect to the individuals that they brought on that trip in light of the fact of the amount of those of those trips. And what was the amount? Well, I think they all ranged between it's in I, I don't want to I think it's in the it's in the uh, Commissioner of Ethics uh, report, but I think they were between 15 and 20,000 for some of them, if I recall for correctly. The this committee. I'll go on the record and state that we're talking about Scott Aitchinson, Cody Blois, and Valerie Bradford, who took a trip uh, sponsored by CJA after uh, these provisions went into place. And so, you know, it, th this is an exemption. Is that correct? It, this is an it's exemption that was it, Exactly. It was an exemption just for the month of July in light of the fact that the trip had been organized um, ahead of... How long of, is the cooling after? So cooling the cooling off period, off period I told them it would be up to two years uh, in light of the amounts. And in was this fact... In was this in legislation and law, or is this just a policy that this, you provided in response to this particular case? So it would be... It, this is a code of conduct, so it's not law. And I did inform them in writing that there should be a two-year cooling-off period. That cooling-off period... Or must? Must. That it would be two years. For, for the individuals okay. that would have been. You are correct that there, there was a monthly communication report last February for a meeting that would have occurred in January with one of the members of Parliament that had accepted a trip. CJA advised me in February that they realized that this individual had been invited to a presentation by CJA by mistake. So they, they were... Uh, forthright in letting me know that they had made a mistake and that they would not do that again and it was an oversight that the MP had been invited and I accepted that explanation. They made a mistake? Yes. Well, they, it was inadvertently that the all members of Parliament that had been part of a mission had been invited and therefore this particular member did come to the meeting and he should not have been there. And would the, would the member have been informed of his obligations? We're talking about Scott Aitchinson, I presume. Yes, yes. Would, would, would he not have been informed of his obligations on taking a trip, ten to $15,000, and then being lobbied after by this organization? Well, Is I, he aware? Well, I don't, I, I don't regulate uh, 
any one of you, but I did send to all of you a one pager about the impact of members of, of sponsor travel on all of you. So I would suspect that he received that information. Fair, remember, yes. To be fair, this is a you've you've created an exemption for CJA. No other organization presumably got this exemption. They got it. They sponsored uh, three MPs that that we know of that made this trip uh, upwards of you know forty five to fifty thousand dollars in in kind of gifts in this way. Um, and then there were parameters put on it. So was he in that exemption provided with guidelines on the two year cooling off period, or is he in breach of the code? Well. Well, the, I don't, Mr. Atkinson could not be in breach of my code. The code applies to lobbyists. So Would it not be an ethical breach for him to follow up with lobbyists that he received a trip on? Well, that you would have to ask Mr. Uh, Finkenstein. I don't know. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, Mr. thank Mr. you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our uh, first round of questioning, six minutes. Um, I do uh, just, uh, Ms. Belanger, you made reference at the top in your opening statement about uh, reviewing the, the act itself, and it hasn't been done since 2012. Just for the benefit of members, there's two ways that we can do that. And in 2012, it was an order of reference from the uh, House of Commons for the act to be looked at. That was the last time it was done. Or it can be done through committee, through a motion of committee to study the act if we wanted to. So that's something to consider perhaps going forward, because in several appearances that Ms. Belanger has had before the committee, she's made reference to the need to uh, look into the act uh, subsequent to the 2012 uh, review. So, Mr. Barrett, with that, uh, I'm going to go to you for five minutes. Okay, go ahead. Commissioner, I want to circle back to some of the uh, names and associations that I listed at the end of my, my first round. So, um, Brian Topp who's associated with the NDP, Don Guy, who's a Liberal. Um, these individuals both uh, collect checks from Loblaws. Last year, their firm, GT and Company, met twice with the Prime Minister's Director of Policy, John Broadhead. And I outlined before um, an additional connection between Mr. Guy and uh, the Prime Minister's office. Uh, if uh, a member, if I were to send a request for you to uh, review this matter, would you undertake a preliminary review? Absolutely. I review everything. Um, Mr. Guratan Singh is the brother of the fourth party in the House of Commons, uh, Mr. Jagmeet Singh. And uh, Mr. Guratan Singh, uh, of course, collects a paycheck uh, as a uh, vice president of Crestview Strategy. Um, he is a lobbyist, uh, the, they're the lobbyist of record for, for Metro uh, Incorporated, which is one of the grocery giants. If I were to send you um, this and request for you to look into it, would you request or would you initiate a, uh, an inquiry? Every allegation that I receive, I look at. Okay, so. Yes. Go ahead. No, it's. it's I'm, I'm, I'm aware of most of the facts that you are referring to today, and I always look at things. I also work with lobbies to ensure that they understand the code's okay. obligations. H have you had to proactively communicate with Mr. Top, um, uh, with his NDP ties, or Mr. Don Guy, or, or Mr. Gurtan Singh? I won't confirm any of that. It, okay. it, those, those are conversations that I have with any individuals if I believe that I need to be proactive and ensure in compliance, I will do that. But very often I open a preliminary assessment and I go from there. Okay. All right. Well, um, uh, thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, uh, correspondence to follow. Uh, I'm going to turn my time over to Mr. Kirk. Mr. Okay. Chair. Go ahead, Mr. Kirk. You have uh, 250. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks uh, to, uh, to my colleague. Um, Commissioner, uh, thank you again for, for, for coming before us. And uh, um, I, I would like to, uh, with the changes that were made in, in the, the uh, lobbying um, uh, uh, code of conduct, um, just curious as to uh, if you can quantify maybe for us, was there significant outreach that was done by, by members who, 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 and I'm not just speaking of, of, of MPs, but uh, uh, th those who are affected, I guess would be a better way to put it, uh, to, to, to ensure that people would be compliant? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, well, the numbers 
just skyrocketed as to the number of individuals who communicated with our office to ensure that the that the code was understood. Um, and incredibly, a lot of calls from members of parliament okay. in in uh, with respect to sponsored travel, which led me to do that one pager that I sent to everybody to make sure that you all understood where I was coming from in respect to regulating lobbyists. Um, we do a lot of presentations to uh, organization, corporations, firms who want to understand the rules, in particular with respect to hospitality and gifts, which I've really um, you know, came down on with, with a, a number, and therefore people need to want to understand what that really means. Yeah, so, so, so help me understand a little bit about what that, uh, that communication from your office looks like. So is, are those emails or those phone calls? Or is that outreach? Is it uh, I, you being asked to come and give a presentation to you know, a group of people, a lobbying firm, what does that unlook like? All, all of the above. Like? So when someone registered to lobby, we automatically offer an outreach session. So very often they take us up on it and they'll be one-on-one -on -one with our advisors. Then we will send emails to uh, groups, organizations that we are seeing um, may not be registered and we say, hey, do you understand the rules just in case you meet the threshold, for example. I never say no to a presentation. So I, we, we've done 123, and think about the number of people we have. So we do a lot yeah. of outreach. Do, so it, it can be upon request. We offer. It's. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Now, now one of the you know it's interesting because of course one of the scandals that has dominated much of the headlines is a company named GC Strategies. Do you find that name misleading in terms of a company that would do? Con uh, contract work with the government being named GC Strategies. I'm just curious if you could just share your thoughts on that. I never really put much thought to the name of a company. I look at their actions and then I decide whether or not it fits my Okay. My thank act. you. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Couric, uh, Madame Belanger. Mr. Fisher, you have five minutes. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Madam Commissioner, for being here. You have such an in-depth knowledge of this that it's, it's really refreshing for us to learn a bit and hopefully take some of this away. Um, my colleague, Mr. Baines, talked about or touched on parts of the, uh, he touched on 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3, and I want to touch on 4.2. Um, so it says here, never lobby an official on their, or their associates where the official could reasonably seem to be, have a sense of obligation toward you because of political work, paid or unpaid, or you are doing or have done for the benefit of the official unless the cooling off period has expired. Yes. So I'm sure you understand that completely. But um, so if Section 4.2 states that you should never lobby an inv individual who may have a sense of obligation due to political work, either paid or unpaid. And we've seen in reporting that Ms. Burns' firm has been lobbying conservative members of parliament, as well as designated public office holders in the leader of the opposition's office. And Ms. Byrne has been reported to be the next national campaign director. So asking, do you believe that Ms. Burns' role as a national campaign director could create a sense of this obligation? So, I mean, technically speaking, within the updated code of conduct that you published last year, back home in the next election campaign, my sign chair can't lobby me for one to two years because of that quote-unquote sense of obligation. So tell me what your thoughts are on on Ms. Byrne holding that role? The first thing I'm going to say is I'm not going to comment on Ms. Byrne and her role. She is not at this time registered to lobby the federal government and therefore I will do my work. Um, but, but if she is not registered to lobby, she's not subject to this code. So let's put that on the table as a first thing. So someone thing. that is clearly lobbying but is unregistered should also be a concern, correct? If, if someone is lobbying and not registered, then it's an act issue that I would refer to the RCMP. Thank you. Um, in a CBC article on March 22nd, uh, quote unquote, it said, some lobbyists listed as working for four check strategies on the federal lobbying database are listed as employees on the website of Jenny Byrne and Associates, but not on the website of four check strategies. I'm, it seems like some work for Jenny Byrne, but use forecheck to maybe book meetings. I'm, again, trying to get clarity. Maybe you can tell me what you think the reality is here as you see it. Um, does that raise suspicions when people are maybe so uh, ultra-fluid 
in their um, registrations? So what the reality is, I don't know because I'm in the process of doing my work. Any company that is registered to lobby at the federal government, so Forcheck is, their lobbyists would be subject to the code of conduct. Okay. So there might be some act perspective and there will be possibly code issues, but I need to do the work to determine if there is any breaches of the code. Are you able to tell us where you are in the process? The preliminary assessment has been opened. Okay, so in your experience, which is long, is it common for lobbyists to register with consulting firms where they are not employees? If, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Is, is it, it common? common for a lobbyist to register with a consulting firm that they are not an employee of? Again, because some members seem to work for Jenny Byrne and Associates, some seem to work for Forcheck, this fluidity of registration. I don't know what the facts of this particular issue is at this point, but usually a government relations firm will, will register. What happens with consultants is they have to individually register. It's not the firm that registered. It's each lobbyist has the responsibility to register as the consultant lobbyist, irrespective of which company or firm they're with. Okay. So if Jenny Byrne is clearly lobbying federally while unregistered, she's inactive as a federal lobbyist, so unregistered. I'm just trying to put all this together, and, and I know you have probably an understanding that you're not able to share with us today. Well, I, I think when, when, we peop when people say that there's federal lobbying occurring, I, I, we need facts to that effect, and I need to go and determine the facts. Well, I wish you uh, Godspeed on your investigation. And, and again, <laughs> I just want to um, thank you very much for the work that you do. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fisher. We're uh, just switching things up. We're going to go to Mr. Green first, uh, suivi finalement par uh, Monsieur Vilmur. And, and with Mr. Vilmur, we'll finish a little early because we have committee business to discuss. Thank you. What would be the penalty for a registered lobbyist who provided sponsored travel to an MP? It, it would likely be just simply a breach of the code and a report to Parliament. So it's reputational, really. So no real teeth, no, you have no ability as it stands now for any type of, it's a slap on the wrist publicly. Uh, you'd mentioned it's a regulation, it's not a law, so there's no criminality involved. Would providing teeth to the legislation, leg like make it make it law, make it uh, criminal, would that help you in any way? S certainly give me teeth, yes. Make it criminal, not necessarily. I think there needs to be a level of discretion, not even currently. I have to suspend anything I look into that's missing a monthly communication report or one communication that should have been registered that the person is unaware of, and I need to send that to right. the RCMP. We need a spectrum okay. of sanctions, and that's what so I'd like to discuss this with the co this committee. I I'm in full support, by the way. I'll go on the record you. now saying, um, respecting the time, I won't do it right now, but I will be bringing to this committee a motion to have a review uh, as per your request. And uh, you may know that I've put forward a motion from this committee. The committee unanimously adopted this to move the question of sponsored travel to PROC. Uh, the idea being that the central budget provide two international trips by the government, no external influences at all at the discretion and full reporting and accountability mechanisms of the House of Commons. Would that help you in streamlining your work so that you don't have to chase kind of all of the paperwork and all the parameters of the, this, what I would say, you know, um, it, it, I don't want to call performative, but it, it's not, it, it doesn't have any real teeth yes. at the end of the I, no. I fully support uh, the, the motion that was adopted by this committee. In my view, I've been in this world of ethics for over 15 years, and I think this, it would go a long way to help with the integrity and the faith and the confidence in decision-making when you remove the possibilities of undue influence, really. That's outstanding. I think that's all I need. I thank you thank for you. your time here. Thank okay. you. And, thank and I thank you for your candor as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Green, uh, Madame Belanger, uh, Monsieur Vilmure, uh, pour deux minutes et demi. Uh, 
Wait for us. Mr. Vimir, you have two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like uh, to raise a point of order. Yesterday, the committee received a letter from Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada regarding the security review on TikTok. And in that letter, they tell us what the steps were and talked about 200 days delays and doesn't state whether or not we will receive a response in those 200 days. Because we're looking at a TikTok report now, I find that this could be problematic to move forward with publishing a report when we don't in fact know what's in the documents. And the way it's written, we don't even know whether or not we'll know in the end. And so for now, I would like for us to delay the conclusion of the report. Because we can't publish a report that is only fluff when there is a security investigation going on. Thank you, Mr. Villemur. Is this a motion that you are tabling that we will not finish the report on TikTok before receiving the information from ISAID, correct? Yes. I propose that we wait and try to put pressure for it to be done more quickly, but that we not conclude our study before having that information on hand. And so, yes, that's an oral notice of motion. Thank you, Mr. Villemur. A situation that uh, Mr. Villemur is proposing, and, and the, the, the motion is in order. We are dealing, we are scheduled to deal with this report on Thursday. Um, as the committee had indicated, uh, they had asked uh, for us to contact ISED to come up uh, with an understanding of when their national security review that was announced in September would be completed. ISED came back, said it would be roughly about 200 days, but we don't know 200 days from, from what? From when they announced the study or from the day we received the letter on April 19th? And so I've made it clear in, in past interventions that uh, I think we should hold off on the study until we see what comes out in that national security review. Mr. Vilmir is formally proposing that we do that now through this motion. Um, and I'm going to open up the floor for discussion on this. Mr. Barrett, go ahead, please. And then uh, we'll see. So, Chair, I um, support the motion, but can we uh, dismiss the Commissioner? Oh, <laughs> Ms. Belanger, I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for appearing before committee thank today. You. Uh, and thank you for your continued good work on behalf of Canadians. And uh, we'll you. see where. This leads us in terms of a formal review of the Act, but uh, Mr. Great. Green has already indicated that he's prepared to, uh, to deal with this, and either through him or through, uh, through the, uh, the will of Parliament. So thank you, Ms. Belanger, thank for you. taking your time today. Thank you very much. Have a great estimates. day. Thank you. So yes. I've got, uh, I've, that was your intervention. I've got Ms. Khalid. Go ahead, Ms. Khalid, on, uh, on what Mr. Vilmuir has proposed. <clears throat> thank you very much, Chair. And, uh, and I, I think that this committee uh, appreciates how long it took for us to finally get a report going. We've been doing um, uh, a lot of um, work that work uh, that, uh, that is very uh, offhand and it doesn't really lead to many reports. And I, I was really quite proud of the way that the committee came together uh, to work on, uh, on this. And I, while I take um, Mr. Villemur's points, on um, the need to to understand uh, the, the and, and to take into account uh, the, the security review, et cetera, I do want to make sure, and I, I've said this again and again, to make sure that this report see conclusion, that this report be tabled in the House. And perhaps, Chair, um, if I if I may suggest, now I. I I'm, I'm sure that uh, you know the clerk and yourself have have done uh, great work to try to get clarity and uh, to try to to get this uh, issue resolved. Um, now, I found that um, you know perhaps uh, we could ask a little bit more comprehensive questions um, to uh, uh, to to the people that we've been corresponding with, and perhaps um, we can ask for a follow up uh, and, uh, and and further explanation or clarification. 
uh, on this. Clearly, we uh, we don't know. Uh, you yourself indicated, Chair, uh, that uh, that you're not 100 percent sure. I think it would be a mistake for us to uh, to table uh, or to shelf this uh, this report uh, without having done our homework, without doing the due diligence of finding out um, where exactly we stand on this. Um, as uh, as I've indicated uh, many times before, Chair, I'm quite. Um, I'm, I'm quite passionate about this report. The changing nature of artificial intelligence, of, of social media, of, of platforms, and its implications on, on uh, Canadians and, and privacy concerns, it's going to always be changing. It is going to always uh, be innovating and, uh, and, and very, very fast-paced. And I think that if we start shelving reports like this, um, we're not going to get anywhere because, you know, let's say 200 days from now, I, I bet you there's going to be different circumstances and we're going to want to, to shelve the report again to based on new circumstances. I think that this is an ongoing issue that we need to continue to work on. I would propose that we seek clarity on timelines and I think that we, you know, I make sure that we, we go forward on this report um, because it is essential, it is it is important, and yes, it is interim. Because I can, I can understand and appreciate that there will be a lot more reports coming on this exact issue. You know, whether it's a year from now, two years from now, ten years from now, fifty years from now. This is this is an evolving issue that we need to deal with as a committee. And I strongly encourage you, Chair, to please don't put this aside because we do need to get this report uh, on the record, tabled in the House, and, and try to work on, on this issue. And, and I, I would uh, perhaps, Chair, uh, as, I, as I've said, um, maybe this motion is a little um, preemptory. Perhaps we should first be going forward uh, to, uh, to get clarification uh, instead, of, um, instead of just moving to, to shelf this. So perhaps before we discuss uh, and, and vote on this motion that you can seek some clarity and get some uh, get some answers and some follow up, Chair. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Ms. Clear. I just look. I'm not looking to shelve anything. I uh, I'm going to do what the will of the committee asks me to do. I do have some concerns, and I think I've stated those concerns uh, in the past. That you know we're going to be dealing with a series of recommendations that this committee could be putting forward in this report that is completely contrary or contradicts what the National Security Review uh, outlines. Um, so my concern is that I don't want to put anything out there in the public realm and then, you know, have it come back on us after uh, we've uh, adopted the report and then uh, and presented it to Parliament. So that's just my concern on this. I Like, I'm indifferent either way on this report. For me, you know, I think it was a good study. I think we had some good witnesses come in. I just don't want to be counter to what I said is doing and the work that they're doing in any of those recommendations that we, we made. I will address one thing. Um, the, the letter that we had asked, uh, if you recall, we came out of the previous two-week uh, constituency break. We had asked informally, I said, on the timelines, because that's what the committee had asked me to do. They said that they were not prepared to give me an informal response, but a formal response, which the committee received yesterday. And now, again, in that response, they talked about 200 days. I do agree with you, Ms. Khalid, that there is no clarity in those 200 days. Does it start when the uh, first public reports came out that they were doing a security review in September, or does it start... Now, I don't know that, so that I, I, I certainly agree with you on as far as the timeline and how long it would take. It could be 200 days from tomorrow. I don't know. So um, I have uh, Mr. Fisher now. Go ahead, and then uh, Mr. Green, I saw your hand up. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and, and you are right. We would be dealing with a series of recommendations. However, that series of recommendations comes from uh, the testimony that the, the committee heard. I wasn't a member of the committee then. This is my third meeting and a little bit deja vu because I, I think that we had this exact conversation when Mr. Vilmua brought it up at my first meeting last week. So I, I'm very much supportive of my colleague uh, MP um, Khalid about not shelving this or not and, and certainly Mr. Chair no one sees you as trying to shelve anything on this. This is this is an interesting conversation, but I would suggest that we, as a committee, decided just last week that we would 
program this Thursday as this continuation of this report. I'm 60 pages in. I, I plan to do my best to get the full 103 pages in, but um, I would like to see us go forward with what the committee decided just a week ago today. Thank you. And, and uh, I appreciate that. What's changed is the formality of the letter that we received from ICED now. So that's, that's what's changed the yes. discussion a little bit. Yeah. And this is where- But it won't was... change the recommendations or the testimony, right? The testimony that was heard by the committee. No, it, right. it, uh, that you're yeah. correct with. Okay, Mr. Green, go ahead, please. Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like my liberal friends doth protesteth too much. I think that Mr. Bill Miller's motion was um, a rational motion. I don't see it as being an issue. I think when new information is presented to committees, particularly of this formal nature, it's something we should take into consideration. The report is in our hands, ultimately, as a committee. We can decide to adopt additional information into our reporting. We can decide to recall witnesses and we can do all of those things. And I think given the complexity of it, there's a there's a value to to addressing and at least acknowledging the work that's being done there. Uh, so for that reason, I support it. I don't see any downside at all in uh, at this point, you know, doing the prudent thing and, and waiting to see what what comes out of that. So I'll support Mr. Vilmir's uh, motion here and, you know, I'm happy to see it go to a vote if there's no consensus. Okay, so uh, thank you for that, Mr. Green. We do have a, a motion on the floor from Mr. Vilmuir. Uh, I don't see any further discussion. Um, so I'm gonna ask if we have consensus on this. Uh, we do on, do we have consensus? No? Okay, so we're gonna have to go to a vote on this, uh, on the uh, motion, and the motion is to uh, wait until the I said uh, report comes out and then um, uh, the national security review and then continue on with our report at that time, correct? Good. Okay, Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Mr. Baines. Against. Madame Lapointe. Contre. Mr. Fisher. Against. Mr. Hausfather. Yes. Ms. Khalid. Uh, against. Mr. Barrett. Yay. Mr. Brock. In favor. Mr. Couric. In favor. Mr. Villemur. En favor. Mr. Green. Uh, je vote en favor aussi. Yes, five, and yes, five, four, cinq, contre cinq. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. I'm going to vote in favor of that as well. 